what I believe is the only foundation that lasts. So, see the books over there. Can somebody hand me a book, uh, by the way? Uh, I'm going to show some things out of that. And uh, the book here, we're going to use as a shovel, basically, as a tool to dig into the Word of God. So this is, contains the Word of God. This is the Word of God. This is a tool we can use to get into the Word of God. This is the foundation that everything's based upon. So basically, we're going to use this tool, and we're going to look at it a little bit, and we're going to go through it. So anybody that already, most of you have already got books, go ahead and bring them to class as well as your Bible. A lot of the verses are written out in the book, and we're going to follow the theme throughout the book and uh, cover all the subjects in there. Any questions you have about any of them, we'll discuss those, open for discussion, comments, whatever. Your input is definitely welcome. If you have a question or you want to pause and go over something, raise your hand. I'll acknowledge you. If I'm in the middle of a thought, I'll conclude the thought, and then we'll acknowledge you. And uh, if anybody sees something I don't see, bring it to my attention, because we want to include everybody. This is for conversation, as well as just for me speaking here. But this edition says the beginning of a new day at the bottom. What is that? It could be applied in many ways. Basically, uh, in my thinking, it's the beginning of a new day. Is Every day is the beginning of a new day. This happens to be at a sunrise. It is the beginning of a new day on the photograph. It's Christmas sunrise, 2010. I took it on the beach over here. So bottom line is, this is the beginning of a new day, the first day of the rest of our life. We have choices to make today. We can walk with God, or we can walk with whatever happens to be convenient. But sometimes walking with God makes it, takes a choice to do so. It's on purpose. It takes a dedication sometimes. Because sometimes there's things that would distract you, lure you away from that. So this is the beginning of a new day, the rest of your life, no matter what you've done in the past, we can start a new today with God. And if we do that, even like Jonah in the belly of a whale, he decided to make it a new day. He had a terrible week, but he decided to make a new day. He ended up on land and had one of the greatest revivals in history. So no matter where you are in life, 
God will give you a new beginning, a new day, no matter what. You have that opportunity only to choose it, like Jonah did. He says, I will follow you. So the second thing is, the title will be the same in the second edition. In the second edition, I have to have a separate subtitle. It will be a biblical tour of our past, present, and future, which is a better description of the content of the book. So we're going to tour everything, uh, from beginnings, origins, to heaven, uh, spiritual warfare, a bunch of stuff. The word revelation refers to the revealed word of God. That's what that's talking about. It's not just the last book in the Bible. The revealed word of God is the revelation of God, from Genesis to Revelation. It's all the word of God. That's what that stands for. Illumination can be a lot of different applications. But let me just give you a couple that the Bible gives you. Let's take a look at Psalms 119. Let's turn to Psalms 119. And let's look at verse 119, verse 105. It's the longest verse, chapter, I mean, in the Bible, Psalms 119. Very interesting chapter, chapter though. So it's Psalms 119, verse 105. And keep your finger there for a little bit. But we're going to look at the definition of illumination, according to the Bible. And uh, whoever's got that, go ahead and read it. Uh, has anybody uh, got that? Uh, yeah. Psalms 119, 105. Who would like to read that? Your word is a lamp to my feet and a light for my path. Okay. So the illumination is God's word shining around us, giving us direction, helping us to see things more clearly. Basically, um, it's really what's necessary in a dark area. This world is a dark area. It's necessary to have illumination from God's word. We really want to see what's going on. So it's something we can't conjure up within ourselves. We have to receive that illumination from God. So let's go ahead and take a look at the verse before that, 104. What does that one say? I gain wisdom from your laws. <coughs> Excuse me. And so I hate all bad content. Okay. Wisdom is key for making proper decisions. Wisdom comes from God. It's not knowledge. You can have a lot of knowledge and not know how to apply it properly. That's not wise. You can have a little knowledge and know what to do with it at the proper time. That's wise. God gives us wisdom. It's based in his word. He says that basically that's where wisdom starts. Not only that, but once you have wisdom, once you see clearly, and I feel this, I can relate with this verse a lot, Sometimes the deceptions and uh, things that are not right start to bother you a little bit more sometimes when you see what they lead to and how wrong they actually are. So sometimes you have to kind of deal with that and realize that you can't let things that are not right take and control your life. Sometimes they can turn you into an angry person. I have to deal with that sometimes and fight anger. Anger is not necessarily bad. Jesus was angry. angry. He cleansed the temple three times out of anger. But it didn't affect his attitude of love. Because right after he cleansed the temple, once at the first of his ministry, twice at the second, at the end of his ministry, he cursed the fig tree right in the middle. It wasn't out of anger, it was a demonstration. Because the fig tree is the temple, representation of the temple, not the nation of Israel, as we'll see later. But the thing is that he wasn't mad, but he had a zealous zeal that angered him for his father's work. He says, this is supposed to be a house of prayer and you turn it into a den of thieves. So this anger can be righteously delivered, like Jesus was our example to do that. And yet right after he was angry, see my problem is I kind of stay that way. You know, it's hard for me to move on. Jesus didn't have any problem moving on. He did what was necessary. And then the kids came to him. He delivered a loving message. He was able to still walk in the spirit, even though he had an authority and a righteous indignation. It's hard for me to say. But the thing is, that's not bad. Be angry at sin and what sin does to people and deception, what Satan's doing to people. So basically, what we want to do is be angry and sin not. Let's take a look at another verse, Proverbs 4, 8, 418. Proverbs 418, uh, we'll look a little bit here as well on illumination just a little bit more uh, look at that, um, how the Bible looks at illumination. Proverbs 4, 18. Do you have that? The road, the road of the righteous travel is like the sunrise, getting brighter and brighter until daylight has come. 
That's right. So to me, that's illumination that isn't blasted all at once. It doesn't happen like you know everything, uh, just like that. And all of us are in a progression of learning. This illumination actually, in my opinion, it's more like a little, I've been in, up in Montana when there's no moon. I think it's very dark. The stars are very bright. I mean, you can see nothing but stars, basically. You can't see anything around you. You're way away from any cities. There's nothing like that anywhere in Florida, really. And uh, if you have a pin light, you can actually see a lot of light out of that pin light. That's the way salvation is. That's the way the Word of God is. Sometimes we just have a pin light. We just know a few things that is true. And it's that little light that God gives everybody. If we take that light and apply it to our path, and look around and make proper decisions, it gives us a flashlight. A little bit better. Then a floodlight. Okay, I can see a little bit more. Then the sun starts coming up. Okay, I can see a little bit more. Until pretty soon the progression is the light gets bigger. You see things clear that you've never seen before. Everything comes into perspective. Things you've overlooked, you realize how important they are. You might have stumbled over those things. And the whole light, after a while, has no shadows hardly. And that's the way the knowledge of God is. We start somewhere and we start applying it like that little light. As a little child, I did that. And he's given my light bigger and bigger. I understand things now that I couldn't even imagine back then. So that's the way that is. Let's take a look at 19, the verse right after that. Let's read that one. We have a choice. We don't have to apply the light. Go ahead and uh, if you have that verse, go ahead and read it. The road of the wicked, however, is dark as night. They fall but cannot see what they have stumbled over. So let me ask you, who's wise here? The person that has a pen light, just a little bit of knowledge, but he's using it to look at his pen and make every step carefully, or the person that's completely shut the light off, decided, I'm going to go it on my own. I don't need a light of God. It's not a wise move, actually. And that's what is going on in our world today. People are stumbling over things that they should see, obviously, and yet they can't see to make their own decisions and to make proper decisions that would affect their future in a great way. So let's go ahead and we're going to look at the book. We're going to take and uh, start the contents, for instance. We introduce, I like the big picture of things. I'm kind of a big picture guy. So I like to see the whole parameter and see all the general idea of stuff before I get into details. Some people are more detailed where they like one little detail build upon the next until they see the bigger picture, like the sunrise evolve, or uh, come out and, uh, and, and happen. But with me, I like to see where I'm at on the map, and then I like to see the details getting finer. So where we're going in this class is basically, we're going to look at uh, the contents, basically. Chapter one is uh, called Receiving Truth or Blinding Deception. So we're going to look at that first. How prevalent is deception in our world? And where does it come from? We may be surprised how common deceptions are in our world even in the churches, and especially in the environment that we work in and live in. So we're going to look at that a little bit. And then the next chapter is origins and definitions. We'll get to that one, uh, and we'll see the Trinity in a very real way. Trinity of God, Trinity of man, in ways that you may not have actually understood before, but are key to understanding not only the Bible, but life. If you understand the Trinity and the keys that will be presented there, you'll be able to understand a whole lot of things that are confusing a lot of people because it's foundational, the Trinity, and each part of the Trinity, what's going on. So then we go to the fall, the fall of man, why it is we can't fix ourselves, what happened in the fall, how we uh, basically ended up in the condition we're in in this world. We started here at the Garden of Eden, perfection. How did the world get like it is today? Then we'll look at the last Adam, the God-man, Jesus Christ. We look at his birth, and we look at who he really was. How can he be 100% God and 100% man at the same time? And that doesn't equal 200%, believe it or not. Because if we want to understand the Trinity, we'll understand that a little bit more clearly. Then we'll look at uh, one of my favorite chapters, God's free will, or God's sovereignty, man's free will. That one covers a lot. And actually, it's a key chapter to understand in some of the extremes in religion. There's extreme Arminianism, 
extreme Calvinism. One says God did everything, and he chooses who's going to be saved and who's not going to be saved. That's more or less in, taught in the higher learning places of colleges and stuff. People have to go through that many times. Other one is more or less believed in the streets where you have to be good to get to heaven. And if you're not good, you could lose your salvation. Both of those extremes are incorrect, according to the Bible. This verse brings them together because they both have Bible verses that they build their foundations on because they're not correctly applied. They're not in harmony with the whole Bible. They conflict with each other, actually. This brings all those verses together and shows how God has his sovereignty and we have our free will and they work perfectly together. Not only that, but in that chapter we'll see it's an example from the Bible of how to, some keys to understand prophecy that most uh, prophecy teachers don't really notice. And it's foundational stuff of what a generation is and how long it lasts, when it starts, a lot of things along that line, but the end times. The Bible is very clear about that, and once you see it, it's undisputable. You have to take verses out of the Bible, because there's no conflict, and people have to just ignore these verses to believe some of the things that are being preached today. So, we'll look at that one, then we'll go on to power from on high. It's about the Holy Spirit. We'll look at how Jesus was tempted. He was tempted in the same three areas we are, but never with sin. You can't tempt God with sin. He doesn't tempt anybody, and he doesn't become tempted with any sin. But in the same three areas he was tempted in, we were tempted in. And he can relate with us. Just like I can't relate with a drug addict on cocaine or basically heroin, because I've not had that temptation. But I can relate with a smoker who struggled with their addictions. Everybody has different temptations, different things that have had to deal with. The temptations have the same roots even though they come in different forms sometimes. With Jesus, he was never tempted with any sin, but he was tempted like we are, but without sin. Then we'll look at the time of crucifixion. We'll find out that Jesus was crucified exactly as he said he was, would be. Was in the tomb exactly the number of days he said he would be. Exactly. It's amazing how closely everything is within the hour. We'll see also that the whole Passover week what all transpired, one thing one after another, and where all the confusion comes in. Because the confusion is both in the Jewish line and the Christian line. Most people are confused on these things. And the most common things you hear will show where they come from and what the truth actually is. And the truth agrees with Jesus and the Bible. It's sad to say that our traditions sometimes do not. We'll look at uh, what happened to hell. That's chapter 9. What happened to hell is basically talking about what happened when Jesus rose from the dead. Hell was changed. There was a time when we'll get into that it was one way, and then he delivered those that were captive there and is now another way. Now, there's those that would like to discount hell. Uh, there's a, actually a whole new movement now I found out about about six months ago um, called Universal Reconciliation. They have their verses, and I went in detail with some people on that. And they're out of context as usual. And, uh, but they try to discount hell to the point that there is no hell. They actually preach and believe that everybody goes to heaven, including Satan. I've heard him say it myself, or write it actually. That Satan will eventually go to heaven, and hell is either a metaphor, or they don't even believe in hell. They talk about the lake of fire. They can hardly deny that. The lake of fire is a metaphor, or it's just a refining process that people could go through instead of going with faith. We'll, we'll address those things. But uh, one thing I'd like to just submit at that point for those that believe those sort of things is at the end times, there's a false prophet that's cast into the lake of fire. A thousand years he's there while Jesus is ruling and reigning. The Bible is very clear about these things in Revelation, I believe, chapter 19 and going into 20. And he's cast in while Satan is bound. He's there a thousand years, false prophet and antichrist, the religious and the political leader. And then, at the end of the thousand year, after a little rebellion happens, and uh, Satan is cast in there. Those guys, and it says that with them, he will be cast in. Now, I would think if I was in the lake of fire for a thousand years, I would have some refining going on. And I'd make a choice. I will go to heaven now, please, if I had that choice. They don't have that choice. It says over and over forever, they'll be there if they go there. We want to avoid people from going there. We don't avoid people from going there by saying it doesn't exist. That'll be shocking when people find out it does. Very shocking. 
So we want to say the truth about that. We'll discuss some of those things. That's a bad subject to get into a lot of times, but it's sobering. Jesus did talk about it, and he didn't have a lot of positive things to say about it. So, but it's got a necessary purpose. That's the problem most people don't realize. We'll get into that as well in chapter 15. What is the purpose of having eternal hell? We'll find out that it has a purpose. It is a warning for all future creations. It is an option for everybody forevermore. An option we don't want to take. We won't even be tempted to because we'll understand things so clearly because of the demonstration. It won't even be a temptation to go there and rebel and sin. Because the Bible says that this great tribulation that's coming will never happen again. There's a reason for that. Hellfire. People will recognize it and realize it. They will never have another rebellion, even though we have free choice in heaven. We won't be tempted to go there or rebel. We'll understand the consequences, which Satan did not. He didn't understand the consequences. Adam did not. Eve did not. They didn't understand. They're all naive. Never seen it before. God had not had a war in heaven. They didn't know God could be a warrior. They just knew he's a loving father, creator. God is a warrior, and he's a winner. So let's go ahead and look at uh, what happens with the key to heaven. The key to heaven is how salvation works. Most people don't understand that. Most people don't realize they know how to get saved. You ask Jesus in your heart. But what actually happens? Why does that make a difference? Why is that the only way I can go to heaven? Why is there not other ways? Like all roads lead to heaven, like some people like to preach. If I'm good enough, I'll get there. Sorry. The Bible seems to disagree with that. And we'll go into why and how that works, salvation, and be unable to qualify to get to heaven, a perfect place, and how that can be applied to us, that perfection. We'll look at good works. What good is good works? If it's not going to earn us heaven, what good are they? We'll look at sowing and reaping. In that chapter, we'll look at how important that is for everybody, not just Christians. God says he's not mocked. What we sow, we will reap. We'll look at those things with live demonstrations and what's going on with sowing and reaping. We'll go ahead and look at, um, come on in. We'll go ahead and look at, um, for instance, the war within. We all struggle. We all have our struggle in this life. We all have victory if we know how. Some of us, it's just a matter of knowing how. Others, it's just a matter of applying it. And even if you know how, it's not automatic. It's still a struggle. It's our old nature. We'll recognize it. We'll start seeing who that voice is in the head that condemns us. It may not be God. It may not even belong to us. It may be a foreign voice trying to put us down. Those things we'll discuss in the war within and how to deal with that. Walking in the light. After you deal with that, and part of dealing with that results in walking in the light. What's it really mean to walk in the light? How do we really know that we are walking in the light? There's a couple keys that we can know that, yeah, we are walking in the light of God. And we are in harmony with the Holy Spirit and empowered to success wherever we go. So there is a key to that. And we'll go into that. There are several things that demonstrate that and ways to achieve that, walking in the light. But it's a daily process. Today is the beginning of a new day. We can walk in the light today, no matter what's happened yesterday. Let's go ahead and look at chapter 14. will be from corruption to perfection. It's actually the judgment seat of Christ, called a Bema seat. That chapter goes into what happens after we die. It happens uh, to be that a lot of people are miscon have a misconception about that. They actually, um, I've heard it said many times, that God forgets things. Well, he may not think about things. He may not have them on the front of his mind. God doesn't forget anything. The Bible is very clear about that. When he, when he remembers something, it means it comes forth. And it comes forth at the proper time for the proper purposes. God is perfect. He doesn't have a memory that's faulty. So we'll get into some of what's going to happen there. It's going to be a great time. Just to let you know, that's going to be a fun time. But there's also going to be a separation going on there, separating us from our sin. There's going to be special times of reward there. And that's going to be glorious. Credited to Jesus Christ, what he does through us in this life. The choices we made on this day and days in the future, as well as days in the past. We'll go ahead and look at uh, basically the devil's final destiny. Now we know that there's a coming of time, the Bible says clearly, there's going to be a great tribulation like never has been before on the earth. Basically, 
we'll see that the church really doesn't participate in that. Uh, some people believe it does, and that's okay. You can believe on those things. I, I'm okay with people that have different beliefs. They have some the foundation to believe it, you know, reason to believe it. I happen to believe the weight is on, and I can prove that. On us, and the Bible makes promises on us escaping the day that's going to come upon the whole earth. But it will come. It will come upon the whole earth at some point at God's perfect timing. It's called the Great Tribulation. You can call it seven years. You can call it three and a half years. The worst part is the last three and a half years. But at the, and that's when the devil is going to be really controlling this world. He's going to make Hitler look like a, like a child of uh, the church or something. He's going to be really charismatic but really devastating to those that basically want to do what's right for God. But he's going to corrupt the world in many ways. He's the Antichrist, and it's going to be a turmoil time. Uh, people go into that in many ways, and I think it's interesting to listen to them. We're going to go into that a little bit, but more than that, we're going to look at the, after he's put away. That's a short time, seven years. And then he's put away for a thousand years, the Bible says. The last millennium, Jesus is going to rule and reign here. It's the day of the Lord. The day is a thousand years. The day of the Lord, when Jesus comes back, he's going to start with ruling. He's going to start with judgment. He's going to judge the, the political leader and the religious leader. They're going to be cast in a lake of fire. He's going to start with cleaning up the government. He's going to be the king. He's going to bring a lot of government with him, those following him to this earth, to rule and reign the same place for a thousand years. We're going to see that environment isn't necessarily our biggest problem. It's a problem. Bad environment's bad for people and encourages people to do wrong. He's going to have the best environment this world's ever seen. Poverty, poverty will be history. People will have glorious times. There will be a little bit of friction because there's still people here, as well as glorified people that have been to heaven will be part of God's government. But there will be regular people having children during that time. They'll be multiplying, remultiplying the earth, sort of like after the flood. Why is it, do you think, that at the end of that thousand years, Satan is released and says for a short season? He has a short season. There's a large war, huge war, that goes on at the end of that millennium, the Bible says. There's a reason for that. And then he's cast in forevermore into the lake of fire, the monument dedicated to corruption, to contain corruption from polluting the heaven and any more pollution of the future earth. So he has a little season there. We're going to look at that. Satan's final destiny. Why he has a little season, his last stand. There's a purpose for that. We're going to look at heaven. What's heaven really like? The Bible has a lot to say about it. What are we going to be like when we get there? What's it going to be like? Is it tangible? Yeah, it's tangible. It's a real place. Are we going to be real? Yeah, we're going to be real. We're going to be touchable. We're going to be supernatural, though. We're going to have bodies, but they're going to be not like this flesh. It'll be a celestial body in a sense that it's going to have supernatural abilities. I believe it'll even glow a little who knows what we'll see when we get there. Bottom line is, we'll be able to do things like Jesus can. We can be in different places, far distances, with no problem at all, just by wanting to go somewhere. We won't be bound by time and space in heaven. But we're going to look at that. And uh, what heaven, the capital city particularly, will be like. It's going to be a glorious place. It's called the Father's House. Jesus is preparing a place for us there, a special place. He calls it our mansion. He's preparing. We can't prepare it. He's doing it. And we're going to look into all that details, how that all fits into actually the Jewish wedding. Actually, it's a very good symbol, a tradition, symbolizing the very thing that Jesus said he did and is doing. So I think that's very uh, interesting to see. The last chapter, we're going to look at reconciling apparent contradictions. And uh, wrong interpretations of the Bible? Yeah. Is the Bible wrong? No. So we're going to look at how these things are confusing, can be reconciled. So we're going to look at those things. That's going to be the basically... Uh, the class it may take us a year to get through. I hope you all attend. I hope you bring friends next week. Um, but let's start in chapter one. We have a few minutes left. And let's just uh, introduce ourselves to the beginning. Second, uh, chapter one says, 2 Timothy 2.15. Let's take a look at that. Uh, 2 Timothy 2.15. Who would like to read that? Go ahead. Yes, it's right there in the book. It's easy to find that. Okay, so right there it says a couple things. One thing it says, rightly dividing the word of truth. 
if you can rightly divide it, obviously you can wrongly divide it, right? Now, a lot of people say, well, everybody's right, there is no wrong. Well, that's not according to the Bible. Actually, the Bible does say some people are wrong. And sorry to say, but if they don't change, they're going to continue to be wrong. You can rightly divide or you can wrongly divide the word of truth. So we're going to look at what the Bible shows, how things fit together. When you wrongly divide it, it's sort of like a jigsaw puzzle. Some things are obvious, the border, you start there. You kind of get the outline. It's the easiest part. It's got some very obvious pieces. And you start putting things where you think they belong. And you realize, well, you know what? It turns out this doesn't really belong there. That piece, it belongs down here. The pattern doesn't fit over here. Not only that, but the, the puzzle just doesn't fit there. If I try to make it fit there, maybe I could make it fit. But if the pattern's not right, the picture's going to be distorted. So basically, the Bible is very much like a jigsaw puzzle that we can actually make things fit improperly, but it's not going to help anybody. It's going to actually bring more darkness, more distortions, more confusion. But when you fit things together properly, you get light, you get illumination, you get understanding. All of a sudden, you see that the whole Bible makes sense. And it fits together so nicely. It's amazing how precise God is. A lot of people like to generalize God. Well, he didn't really mean that. Generally, he meant this. But really, he's precise. And we'll see how precise that is. And so right of dividing is important. Part of doing that is study. Study is an important thing. Study is just simply thinking about things. Sometimes it's gathering information, but we can just gather a little bit of information and study that for a while, which really involves meditation. That's the key. Meditation is simply rolling over and thinking about all the ramifications of this information. How do I apply this information? What does this mean to the things around this information? How does this uh, change anything in my life or my circumstances or what I see around me? Sometimes it's radical. You realize that you get a truth and you realize that changes everything. Wow. Nothing's the same after that. Some things are just little things like, that's nice. That's a little nice little piece of the puzzle right there. That looks good there, and I enjoy that. But it all comes from meditation, illumination. And that meditation is just, it exercises our brain. Some people think, well, I can't understand the Bible. That's because they talk themselves into that. The Bible says the Holy Spirit will illuminate these things to his children. And if you ask the Holy Spirit to illuminate these things to you, he will, one thing at a time one uh, whatever you need at that moment at a time and then he'll allow you to remember it and the thing is i've actually seen on tv where they've actually analyzed brains physically the brain is physical our thinking process is not physical it's part of our spiritual makeup but our brain is like our hardware and they said that our hardware our brain through meditation proper meditation not confusing meditation even though all of it probably helps a little bit but actual proper meditation where you start building things. They say our brain actually increases its strength. The capacity to connect things becomes stronger. Our memories become stronger. Our whole, everything in our brain physically, like our body getting exercised, can be exercised to improve through meditation on the Word of God. Not only physically, but then things start making sense mentally. You start, hey, I recognize that. That's not right. I'm not going to do that. That's a deception from the devil. Or, yeah, that's, that's definitely, that's interesting. I'm going to keep that for later, because I think I'm going to be able to use that sometime. So, in light of that, let me ask you. I know I've seen the books when I was a kid. Dots all over the page. More complex than this. They luckily had numbers to show me the way. And uh, once I connected all the dots, I would see the pictures. Uh, it was interesting. That's what we're going to do through this class. We're going to start connecting those dots. You're going to see things very clearly. Some things may be up for discussion, but most of it is going to be right there. It's pretty undisputable once you see it. So, like connecting the dots, I have some dots up here. What's that look like to you? Anything particular? Nothing. Okay. Uh, well, we're going to connect a few. Connect this one, and this one, this one, this one. This one, this one, and this one. How's that? Look clear. Not really, right? No. Look like a couple of boxes, right? Yeah. We'll just connect some more dots. Pretty soon this thing might develop. Let's just connect this one, 
and this one. Okay, meh. This one, this one, this one, this one, this one, this one, this one. Hey, maybe something's going on. Let's connect this one, this one, and this one. Any idea what might develop? Yes. Got an idea here. Okay. What might develop is a concept, an understanding, visual, that you can see, or before you couldn't see. Now I might connect this one, this one, this one, this one, this one, this one, and this one, because that's the way I did it over here. Did it help my concept? All of a sudden, confusion sets in, didn't it? So I made two mistakes. People make mistakes all the time. God understands mistakes. We're growing. We make mistakes. The question is, what do we do with our mistakes? Now, we can do two things. We can say, well, if, anybody, if I ever told anybody I was wrong, don't ever listen to me again. I'll just cover it up and put it aside. And I won't look at this. I'll talk about the things I did right. Well, maybe I was better than some things. But you could say a lot of things about, hey, I grew up like this. This is the way I see it. This is the way I'm going to do it. And that's the way I'm going to always do it. Not profitable to the Bible and your understanding of it. But if I remove my mistake and decide, well, you know what? I'm going to change. When I see something, that I need correction, I'll change that. All of a sudden, the whole picture gets clearer. And that's what we're going to do. We're going to remove the mistakes. We're going to connect the dots. You're going to see the Bible like you've never seen it before. And that's what the whole class is all about. Connecting the dots, removing the mistakes, and seeing what God's word has to say to us for this generation. If we do that as a person, we'll see a difference in our life. If we don't do that and don't remove the mistakes as a person, once we understand them, some people don't. They understand, well, that's not right, but I'm going to do it anyhow because we've always done it that way. That's considered rebellion. That no longer is ignorant. Ignorance is one thing. God will bring us out of ignorance if we allow him to let our light get bigger or we can stay with a little pin light and just not understand what's going on. But when we move from ignorance to rebellion, now God blesses everybody, saved and lost. But when we move as Christians or unsaved into rebellion, it limits his blessings severely. He will still bless the rebellious to some degree, but it's very limited. Whether I'm a person whether I'm a church, whether I'm a nation. If I'm in rebellion to the Word of God, and I know that I'm in rebellion to the Word of God, it will limit God's blessings. Our country is built on the blessings of God originally. We have been rebelling against that as a nation. Our time may be limited as a power that we've seen in the past if we don't quit rebellion. Just there's a lot of history about nations that have come and gone why that happened. Most of them forgot the roots, what made them great. Rebellion didn't make us great. Understanding the Bible, if you look at our forefathers, that's what made us great. And then we applied it in our government and in our societies. So I pray that that's what we start doing again. Just close in prayer. Dear Father, we do thank you for this time that we come together before you. We dedicate this time, these future classes unto you. We thank you for the opportunity that you give to us to make proper choices today. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you all for coming. Thank you.